You're listening to the Career Jump Podcast. Insights, interviews, and success stories to inspire and give you the edge when you make your next career jump. Hosted by your career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. So welcome back to the Executive Career Jump podcast. I'm Andrew McCaskill, your host and career concierge today, and I'm delighted to be joined by Dominic Joyce. Thanks for coming to join us today, John. Yeah, thank you for having me, Andrew. Delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm delighted you're here as well, because you've got an interesting blend of skills. So I'll pass over to you to say a little bit more in a minute. But the fact that you currently work as a VP of people, you've got a senior TA background, and you do the CV and LinkedIn coaching for job seekers on the side. I know without question, you're going to have some good insights for us today. So just by way of intro for the listeners, tell us a little bit more about you and, and what you're up to. Sure. So lo and behold, nearly three years later, down to 400 clients and like your good self, you know, a lot of exposure on LinkedIn, millions of views and hundreds of likes and thousands of views on posts and so forth there, just to try and help people in the current job market. And that's all it was that I set out for was to kind of give people that in that free impartial advice initially to help them navigate the job market better and understand what's good and bad on CVs and LinkedIn profiles. No, and there's a need. We know there's a need. So you mentioned you you were fed up of seeing some of the the poor presented CVs. What kind of mistakes were you seeing people most commonly make? I think it's a, a lack of the ability to kind of sell themselves because look, you can put them in front of a hiring manager and they can talk to the cows from home about how good they are and what they do. When it comes to articulating skills on a bit of paper, it's kind of be the door opener. They can do that. For example, I recruited in engineering, so we had gas engineers, sparkies, who could rewire your house, a very intricate job, or a gas engineer fit your boiler, but they couldn't tell you on a bit of paper what they did and how they did it well and the impact of what they did. So when it came to I just kind of thought, well, they can't be alone. There must be other people that can't sell themselves. So the common mistakes that I commonly feel are just the ability to kind of promote yourself because look at the market right now. We posted the role in my current company in November time for a business analyst, 622 CVs. Wow. How am I going to determine who's the best of the best? And it's down to people not really selling themselves and what they bring to the table because technically any job title in different industries, the, the main crux of what you do is the same, but what you deliver and how you do it, it's all down to you as the person. So that's kind of where people don't sell themselves. Common mistakes too, have all been there, really simple mistakes around <laughs> punctuation, people put on their CVs, attention to detail, and then misspell <laughs> the first line of the sentence. <laughs> we've all been there, we've all seen them too as well. I think sometimes, again, people think less is more, um, don't tell you enough, or there's too much that you get literally one piece. Some CVs that I've had, I could turn into a short novel and people will just think, what's that? And it's a CV. No, get out. So I think there's no real sort of like top five pinpoints of mistakes, but it's just a common attention to detail. And I think you'll probably agree that it's the most important bit of paper you're ever going to need. It dictates how much you earn, which then leads to the size of the house you live in, the car you drive, where your kids go to school, what you do for our activities on the weekends. It kind of dictates everything that leads on from that. But people just don't give it the care it deserves. It's funny, isn't it, when you think of it in that context? It is the most important bit of paper. You're right. Yep, see all of those uh, challenges and well stuff going on. There's been debate for a long time in the industry as to, you know, the death of the CV and whether it will continue. But as, as long as I've been in the industry, people have been saying, oh, it's all right, we won't need CVs in the future. That, has, that moment hasn't come yet, has it? Do you think it ever will? Like, what's your take on wh- where the CV is headed? Well, obviously, Da Vinci was the first guy to compose a CV in, what, 1452, was it? <laughs> my, my dates could be completely wrong, but I know it's a fair few hundred years ago. And since then, I'm sure there's ways to basically improve and to update your CV or to make it different. Let's talk about having video CVs, but then you can argue on the flip side there, that's a conscious bias. Uh, you've got companies now that remove names from CVs and ATS systems, so it's just basically like brown bear or purple unicorn. I think it will a CV ever be not required anymore? It depends. You're going to get people that are going old school and go, well, I've always worked on networking referrals. I've never needed a CV because my name carries my, you know. So I think, I think it will never go away. I think people want something that's more quick, don't they? I think so to skim a CV takes 10 seconds. Can you find something really that's going to be quicker than that to make your hiring decision easier? Probably not. You could be a lot more detailed in how you review a CV by having perhaps a video CV. But when push comes to shove, as a recruiter myself, you kind of want that 10-second skim to know, one, are they qualified for the job? Is the experience there? And are they, are they going to be a good fit for the role itself and the team? So 
unless you tell me something can do that quicker and more efficiently than current CV now, for the for, you know, there's a post here a day on Daily Mail about AI being used to source people's CVs out again there, where I think just a CV is what is personable and it has to be personally viewed by a person on the other end. So unless you're going to change the format or make it easier for someone to look at a CV and go yes or no, then I think for the time being and for the next probably 10 years, it will remain the same. Yeah, I think so too. It is the universal language of how people communicate their career story, right? So you, you and I don't just help people in the UK. It's people all over. And I've spent time overseas and that kind of thing. And it's it's an internationally recognised standard document. It's how we communicate. It's a language. Yeah. 100%. So I've seen many disruptors come in and some really good stuff. But uh, yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere soon. So I was interested yeah. to get your take on that. So we, we've spoken about some of the mistakes then. So what about what good looks like from a CV point of view? Say somebody is listening to this right now who's about to pull together a CV document to go to market. Mm-hmm. What kind of process or advice would you give them around how they do that, assuming they're capable of producing it themselves? Hmm. I think a lot of it, again, the first thing to remember is the CV is completely subjective. There's no template to say what you must put on there or what must go on there. There's rough guys that people will release and say, here's how you present it. Is what not to include on there, but ultimately it's you as the candidate thinking what you can put on there that will give you the best chance to impress a recruiter or a hiring manager to get you in the door. So what looks good? I think a template itself there, being creative. I've recruited for designers, grad craft designers, UX UI people, which of course it's all bells and whistles and looks visually appealing. You then got the accountants, no offense, but just this kind of very, you know, just black on white, kind of like a restaurant menu, just there's a lot of white background there. I think it's about voice to people, look, you've got to be a peacock amongst chickens. You've got a peacock your CV, make it stand out because right now, as you mentioned earlier, and anyone else that's recruiting it's probably listening to this will relate that you're seeing an increase in CVs to a job now. And as you keep just flick through them, it's like road lights on the motorway, it's just repetitive. So you want them that really catches the eye. So it basically makes you stop, look at it and review it. And it's about having the style and the context and the substance to basically make it marry together. So I think template is quite important because it's an initial glance. And as a human race, we're, you know, we're like magpies, anything shiny and pretty, we kind of gravitate towards it. So nine times out of 10. So I think making sure it looks nice and then having it in the first 10 seconds, you want to tell a reader what it is you are, what you do, what makes you unique. So, you know, it's a personal summary punchy impactful core skills on there list of achievements on there which i'm sure you agree half the time people don't even tell you what they do what they're going to do in that's the one key caveat there of how you differentiate yourself between other people in your profession that do the same job as you and make it digestible so not tra- like a transcript so bullet points on there to kind of break up text you can go online and you can type in a cv of your industry and view examples and you'll probably see 25 different examples so it's like looking at new kitchens, isn't it, or new cars. You can go and do all these reviews, but ultimately it's whatever. When you look at it, it looks and feels right to you, and you're happy to put your name to that when you send it out to recruiters and hire managers. So clear, concise, succinct is kind of the goal to go for and make it look nice because when I design people's CV templates, they're always different. And commonly the feedback is, look, I like how the template looked when I read it, and then makes sense and the context came together for me. But I had just been a typical black on white it may just kind of fall into the mire and just been lost with other sort of 99 series that were in there. Be a peacock amongst chickens. There you go. That's the title for the podcast sorted. That's that's it. There you go. So yeah, no, I really enjoyed that. Tremendous value in there, Dom. Thanks for sharing that. Really recommend everybody takes that on board. And I love the fact that you said that they are quite subjective as well. I think there's a lot of CV writers and coaches going out there suggesting they've got the magic formula that works in every scenario. And it's just not the case, is it? Um, it, it completely varies. So thank you yeah. for clearing that up. I've got to ask you as well, whilst we've got you about ATS systems, being that mm-hmm. you're a VP of people and a head of TA type background. There's been a lot of noise and talk over the last 12 to 24 months, really, on you know ATS systems filtering you out and how your CV needs to be in order to be ATS compliant and all this kind of stuff. Some of which I believe is marketing to get people to buy expensive templates. But anyway, what's your take on the whole ATS thing and, you know, sitting on the side of it that you do, like what considerations do people have to bear in mind with regards to ATS systems? Mainly sort of format of CVs. Any company, CV writer that will give you this whole tagline of 
are make your CV ATS compliant probably don't have a clue about what ATS is actually doing their function. This is whole quote that you have to get past the robots. And even the um, Daily Mail BBC did a post recently about you know robots are now rejecting your CV. A lot of scare tactic lines to kind of again like you say coax you into part of a lot of money to give this ATA utopian style CV. When in reality, if you've got a word document and it's you you know go easy on the icons, remove tables on there. Text boxes transfer quite nicely, but just a general Word document is fine. Even a PDF document, if you can then hit Control and A and highlight all the text on there, that's going to be picked up by an ATS system. So all this dribble about our make your ATS compliant CV, ask them what, if you are going to go with them, ask them what it is that makes it so ATS compliant. Because in reality, it's a Word document that basically can be read. Companies offer this whole, like these things, I like put your CV into our system, we'll tell you how good it is. I don't buy that. It didn't involve obviously people here. It's humans hiring humans. So don't trust the computer to tell you how good your CV is. Trust the human beings to tell you how good your CV is that knows the brief, knows the hiring management team, knows the team they're looking for. But yeah, I think I, I did a re- bit of research too as well last year. So I spoke to 175 recruiters internally, not agency, but in companies who across their career worked across 280 jobs. I said, look, I want to know from your point of view, because this really bothered me last year. How many of your ATS places that you've worked with, either A, will auto-reject a CV based on words or anything on there, B, will it rank or score them, i.e. this CV is matched 80% of the role, or C, how many of them are viewed by you in the first instance? Now, 80% of them were viewed by a human recruiter in the first instance, which is a massive amount still, still being looked at by every Tom, Dick and Harry that works in recruitment. And the ones that didn't, I asked them for more information, right? So when they're ranked and scored, do you still look at them? Of course I do. I'm a recruiter. I'm naturally a nosy person. So I'm not going to trust the computer to tell me someone's 20% matched to a role when it just could just be down to formatting a CV or perhaps not reading the right information. When they're auto-ejected, commonly it's a case of, look, killer questions. Do you require sponsorship? Yes. Auto-reject. This is a field-based role. Are you a car driver? No. Auto-reject. More often than not, that's the reason why you're getting these rejections, not based on the fact that you've not put a certain keyword on there. So ATS systems there's there's obviously bolts on there to make it easy for recruiters there's ai functions on there you can you know they can be as simple as basically holding cvs and you move them through the process you can input in there a certain keyword search on there so i think the answer to the question andrew is more case of companies will decide how they want it to work for them and try and remove a certain human element at least the sort of initial first stages where it's also the case of i've seen companies now implement sort of like shl and sjt testing and personality testing to really kind of get down to the front of who the person is but in my opinion personally i've made the rest highs that i have having a conversation with someone that's then reaffirm their cv yeah it's a contact sport recruitment contact. Yeah. very much so great thank you for clearing that up some really good guidance there you do see some of these ats compliant cvs as you say which even if they do pass the ats no human's gonna you know they're not going to be the peacock in amongst the chickens when they go through because it's just massive block text of buzzwords rather than anything that's selling themselves so definitely a balance to be uh, drawn there fantastic insights thank you hey everybody it's uh, andrew here just wanted to very briefly interrupt this podcast episode to tell you a little bit more about our career jump club so our career jump club was created to help job seekers understand what they want and how to get it right so Becoming a club member is a great move if you're looking to get the clarity and confidence in order to secure your next role. With the membership, you get a number of different things. So first thing you get is access to our online platform, which has over 30 videos, 40, 50 different templates, workbooks. And it takes you through everything from sort of understanding what you want to how to position your CV and LinkedIn, how to interview, how to close offers and negotiate better salaries, a full end-to-end job search course effectively for senior leaders. So you get that, you get a fortnightly group coaching call, um, which is with me and with the other members where we bounce around best practice, share slide decks, share techniques, and share the latest data on what's working for people. And you get to most importantly, become part of our closed LinkedIn group and our closed community. And in there is where the magic often happens because you get people referring each other into opportunity, supporting each other and just sharing. And that's what it's all about. So. If you're financially able and you'd like to invest in your job search, head on over to www.execexeccareerjump.com, all one word, forward slash club. 
and you'll find the landing page and come and give it a go. We'll see you in there. Anyway, back to the pod. So one interesting question I had for you, bearing in mind the breadth of things that you've done is, like, why does the hiring process, do you think, feel just broken for people? Like, we see a lot of clients uh, struggling to attract top talent on one hand. And on the other hand, we work with a lot of job seekers and candidates who've got a lot of value to offer and are frustrated that they can't get hired. So there's something in the middle of that hiring equation that's not quite working for all the parties involved. You can throw recruiters in there who uh, the agency recruiters and headhunters who get a mixture of rave reviews in a hard time as well. But what, what, what's your view on the, the overall hiring ecosystem and why people are getting so frustrated with it? And, and just, yeah, I'd be interested to hear your, your commentary. I think a lot of it comes down to the company and how they pitch one, the company and the roles and how they hire because you always see this chilly to style approach to a company. We're awesome. We'll give you this. We'll do this. And then, which is great to kind of really sell that benefit of once you get in there. It's like buying a new car. The car's amazing, but to get to that car, the process of completing forms and paperwork is laborious. It's tiring. It's, it's just monotonous. Similar to the hiring process, you can purchase a company that's amazing to work for when you make the hiring process clunky, just cliche, are you really giving the people that first experience that they really want to join your company? Because you'll sit there and bang, you're drawing about how great you are to work for. And then straight away, when you go to apply to a job, you upload your CV, page two. Now, please, when you copy and paste all your CV information onto this page here. So there's, I think as well, the problem is that companies don't talk to candidates for feedback. They never ask people, look, okay, so you went like this role. How could we improve the process? What didn't you like? Even just giving feedback, I've had people that are rejected for roles that just sent me email saying, Dom, listen, really appreciate you saying no to me because you've come back to me. Yeah. It's something so simplistic as, as acknowledging someone's existence on your ATS or to apply to a job that people don't do. So I think what's broken right now is people, I think definitely now in the current market, people, it's, it's a candidate rich market. You can be as picky as you want to, but that doesn't then mean that you can be a total. I can say the word arsehole about it. You, you, know, you can't just be ruthless and cut people out by just, just ignoring them. So I think companies need to work on how they hire people, the process they go to. We touched on ourselves, Andrew, back and forth, didn't we, with, with, with questions, you know, competency questions. How relevant are they to the role? You're going to get someone that fabricates a, you know, a total BS answer which makes them look good, but in reality it could be a complete, complete lie. Whereas is it more about having a team fit? So where I work now, we have quite a long process of interviewing here where they meet the whole entire team, but the whole team's met that one person and reciprocation that can just met the whole entire team they're going to work with. So on the first day, there's no sort of like awkward sort of first day at school, hi, I'm so-and-so. You've had that first introduction from everyone you're going to work with. And that's, for me, as experienced recruiter, is one that I've really enjoyed. Whereas in past companies, it's always been high management team that have to then go through this really clunky process of when you take a briefing call, like, which questions are we going to ask them that are competency based? Then have to go through a tick sheet of a, a hiring pack, which is very rigid. And it's a case of, well, and you know, we spoke about it as well a while back. I was a group of data scientists, and everyone had to go through an SJT assessment, which of course is very much around personality traits. And data scientists are the bright minds of tomorrow, they're Oxford PhD educated. What they can do with data, you know, it's just absolute wizardry. But yet they always fail the SJT test commonly, as we found with the because it's not designed and geared for them as in their rationale and thinking. So I think companies need to look at how they adopt staff and how they actually attract staff, first of all, but then also the candidate experience throughout the journey itself there because, you know, people buy people. So if you're then promoting a service that's then not delivering what you want from your candidates, they'll go elsewhere. Now, I've been there myself, but I've interviewed companies, had a great experience, great feedback. I would apply there again. I have ones where literally I got rejected from a job six months after I applied. And I was like, well, we we'll are applying to you again, Sunshine. So I think it's broken. It's definitely broken the process for a lot of companies. Amazon, eight stages. And at no point are they obliged to give you feedback or so at any stage. To me, that's a broken process. I don't care how big you are. Everyone deserves feedback because they then enter into a face-to-face -face conversation with you. So I think it's more a case of no one consults candidates on their experience. And no one, and no one actually sort of talks to the candidates when they've been interviewed and they joined. So Dom, you've joined us now, you've been here. By the way, how did you find the recruitment process now you joined us? Did you find it enjoyable? Yeah, I did. Or if I can speak freely, that didn't really quite sit well with me. So I think I think a lot of it comes from up top 
where people like CEOs, they call, they think they have this idea of how it should work. No one really asks the recruiters or even the current staff that were here what looks good to you because it's a team event. Like you said, it's obviously transactional. You need to make sure that your the experience they're getting is an enjoyable one, whether they join or not. No, absolutely right. Yeah. And, and I think uh, there's so much money going into customer experience and not so much going into candidate experience when actually the two are far closer aligned than most CEOs realise, I would suggest. Yeah, 100%. I mean, these are your biggest attractors of promoters. You Absolutely. know, there's people that are projecting for jobs, but I've been with them, I've been pan assured, been informative. I've then put a post out the next day on LinkedIn about another job looking for. They'll tag in friends in it. They'll like yeah. and engage them with it. If, if you give them a sore service, they're not going to touch your barge pole. They might even take you off LinkedIn as a connection. They have no, you know, look at Glassdoor as well. On Glassdoor, people can go on there and they can leave reviews, not only if they've been an ex employee of the business, but also the recruitment process. So be careful how you interview people because if you, as a company that's doing that and you're big enough, you're on glass door and people have got free reign to go on there and say, I enjoyed the process or no, I found it really laborious. So, you know, be mindful of that as well. Absolutely. No, absolutely right. Interesting that you touched on the uh, personality testing and I was giggling my head when you were talking because we did a, a chief data officer search a few years ago and uh, same thing. Our process mm-hmm. was for everyone to do a McQuaig, which was the the particular uh, personality profile we were using at the search firm and all of the chief data officer profiles came back completely flat because they'd basically tried to reverse engineer what how the data was going to be used and be all things <laughs> to all people and so it gave us zero insight on those guys so that's funny that you said that but how should somebody approach these types of assessments because they are becoming you know, more and more common as you said and understandably so because it's giving another data point to the hiring team and you know, behavior fit and culture ad and all of that are very important. So how should people approach those kind of assessments, Don, when they're asked to do these personality tests? Be yourself. You know, there's, well, why would you change to work for a company where, <laughs> yeah, I mean, why would you change your stance? And I said to people when I was told about the upcoming assessment, be yourself, go if you've got instinct because you don't want someone to look at that and second guess themselves because then the answer they're giving you aren't really their true reflection of their visualization of that question or the approach to it. So, you know, I wouldn't go on a date with someone and try and be someone totally not just to kind of impress them and then realize that when I do spend time with them, i.e. in a new job or relationship, the person that I pitch myself to be at initial point of contact isn't really the person I am. Plus also, if it's a case of you had to lie to get into the business or uh, skew your answers to basically tell them what you think they want to hear, is that something you really want to work for? So be yourself. If you score well and do well out of it, guess what? They probably have the same mindset towards approaching the recruitment or the right hiring process of what you're bringing to the table. I've seen people that have been great on paper, gets them to the test itself there, and they just completely fudge it completely because even they don't take time with it. So anything you do as well, like if it's McQuaig or if it's SJT test, go online and just literally type in practice test. Do two or three. They're free to do, and it might just basically help you prepare for it so you know what to expect. Fantastic tip. Absolutely love that. And I've heard, I've heard you use the dating analogy once or twice in your content as well. And I think it's a good one. So LinkedIn, let's talk LinkedIn whilst we've got you. You're a, a, a big user. You produce content. Uh, you obviously help people with their own LinkedIn approach to job seeking stuff as well. What kind of advice would you have for you know people in transition around leveraging LinkedIn to their benefit? Um, be, be visual. You know, people can't engage with what they can't see. I think, Someone said a stat the other day that 1% of LinkedIn is actually active. So the millions okay. and millions of people on there were just literally like, it's almost like people like yourself and me who comment and post daily are like, like rock stars on stage. And all the people watching it are just basically around the outside watching the show. Get involved. Like if it's participation is, is, is important here. People like I say to them, look, you want to be, you know, find a new job. Don't just sit there and hit apply to jobs on LinkedIn. Go out there, engage with recruiters, engage with high managers, comment on their posts, just, you know, Add your insights. Everyone's got something to add to the bring to the table, whether it's experience around the hiring process. Some of the biggest like viral feeds of people that have which you had pain to so share good times, share pain, share knowledge. Like I don't my post, I don't just always bang on about recruitment. I try and share personal instincts, information about the industry, try and educate, offer support and advice, or just literally even a shoulder to cry on. I think. People that want to use the LinkedIn to leverage itself there, and there's people like obviously Leah Turner, who we all know now, who a year ago was non-existent on LinkedIn by, you know, other people that I can probably sell a year or so ago, I wouldn't know who they were. 
I've used LinkedIn for probably 12 years now. And I think it's, ha- it's what do you want out of LinkedIn? Do you just want to go online there and improve your personal brand and just get more engagement? Do you want more clients? Do you want to get a job? You know, if you're a job seeker on LinkedIn, just basically copy and paste in your CV and a generic message to recruiters is a sure way, way to fail. We've been there yourself, haven't you, as well? There's nothing worse than basically being a copy and paste the message. So a little tip for everyone now is what use LinkedIn on your phone. You can send people a voice note. That's a message. You can send a video message. I had two last year that were sent to me voice notes, and I touched too many people last year with my content. It's, you know, and I probably get a day, four or five CV, CVs and emails about jobs. Half the time, it's I'm looking for a job as an offshore engineer in a wind farm. My background is banking and financial services. Well, how am I going to help you? So I think be concise in what you do. You know, it's not a like Facebook where you've got to basically add just your friends. Add people that are going to add value to your network. Add recruiters. Add people from your industry. Have a photo as well. It just helps to kind of know who I'm talking to. But it's what you make of it. People can use it to the best of their ability. They can literally share content to the cows come home. But if it's not done in the right way, it's not clear and concise, thought-provoking, engaging. It just basically spams people's inboxes and their, their feeds for nothing, really. Totally. And it's so interesting that 98 99% of people are just lurking and not doing anything. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking about getting started on sharing some content, do give it a crack. Yeah, there's plenty, still so much room for your voices to get out there, despite what you think. Some people just think it's already saturated. It's nowhere near yet. So thanks for making that point, Dom. I can't let you go without asking you about interviews. Everyone hates interviews. <laughs> and, uh, and again, I'd be you know really interested to hear from you around interview tips, what kind of advice you'd give people and any kind of golden nuggets that you've got to help people who are listening, who might be going to interviews over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the common thing I say is do your research, not just when they started, because it's always like, what do you know about us? And they always sort of read from a pamphlet. You started in 1971 with a two million pound funding from, it's like, well done for reading the website. You can obviously read, well done. It's um, look at news articles. So I see you've recently um, done an initiative for the banking community that's really, you know, around or young hiring. That's awesome. Or I just noticed that your um, office in London recently won a, um architectural award. That's awesome. But, you know, just anything that you can kind of show that you've intently looked at the company, what they do, looking at news articles, press articles. I've done a look on Glassdoor. You've got 4.2 out of 5 stars for the employee ratings. What makes you guys great to work for? Mate, and just not your typical cliche question. So my favourite one to ask a hire manager is, look, John, Jane, Jimmy, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. You've been where you are now for the last seven years. What keeps you there? What is it about this company that keeps you staying what you're doing, doing it well? And why, why wouldn't you leave? These are nice and motive questions rather than just a case of what's the holiday like here? You know, what's my, you know, what's a typical day look like for me? So interview wise too, just be honest and transparent. Like I said earlier, there's no point in trying to go there. And, and also don't be submissive. It's not a, an interrogation. You're not sort of handcuffed to the table and they're just smacking you with a bit of paper saying, what do you know about us? It's a case of go there, be yourself, but also make sure that you ask the right questions to know what you're going to want out of that employer and obviously mentioned it earlier about data analogies and it's true like you're committing eight hours of your day at least this employer same as a relationship same as a, a partnership if you're going to commit that much time and effort to it make sure from your point of view as the candidate this company's the right one not just to cover your bills and to give you some money with because then you're committing to that for months years whatever but you're not truly happy so i say make sure you do your research not just to impress the employer but also to make sure it's the right role for you. We've all been there and had jobs where we just sort of went there and just thought, well, do you know what? 30K is better than no K and it'll do for the time being, which of course then can harm your CV from your short-term roles. And of course, then it, they've got to then go to market again and rehire your role in two months' time. So I guess make sure, of course, that you listen to the questions. There's a common one too. You ask them tell you about a time you've done this and they just go off at a tangent about something else. Commonly, if you're getting asked competency questions, I don't agree with them, but if you are, 60 seconds, 90 seconds tops, star approach, Carl approach always works quite well. But more important, just be yourself. And make sure, of course, that you come out of that interview having the information that you want from them as well, because they grill you for most of it. you then got that last sort of 10 minute snippet to really sort of drill down to how they're going to benefit you. Because it's not only a case of, right, you're paying me for a service as being an employee, but also what in return are you going to give me as, a, as an employee? Are you going to give me mental health stability? Are you going to give me support, training, nurturing? Because it's not a one-way street when it comes to interview, but also in hiring. I'm giving you my expertise, but what are you giving back to me as an employer? 
no one does that. People are very submissive nowadays. It's almost a case of that nervousness of, oh, I've got impressed them, so I'm going to talk all nicey nicey and ask the generic questions. Um, you know, no one's uh, ever really sat down and asked me a competency question, you know, about interviewing, like, give me time when you didn't hire someone and it wasn't the right fit. It's all just a simple cliche of what are the hours like here? What would you say is the hardest part about this job? You know, just be different and get out you what you want to. You've got permission, folks, as a VP of people telling you to go in and reverse interview. And it's such an important point. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Thanks, Tom. Uh, really good. Uh, I can't let you go without asking you. Uh, I'm a big quote fan. So have you got any quotes that that you particularly like, you live by or that help guide what you do or or any, any memorable quote that you, uh, that you that you like? Yeah, there's, there's one that I created, but I think I might plagiarise it a little bit. But one that I've always lived by for years is don't go to people for advice that you wouldn't accept criticism from. Mm. Okay. I like it. No, it's, I think I'm, do you know, I might need to edit out. I think I've got that completely wrong. It's um, don't take criticism from people that you wouldn't go to for advice. That's the correct ah, term. Yeah, got it. And I, I, I've completely fudged it up. Sorry, Andrew. But, it, does um, work, it does work the other way as well, though. I was uh, chugging it through my head. It does work the other way. Does it? It might do, yeah. I think the correct term is don't take criticism from people that you wouldn't go to for advice. I Meaning, yeah. people will sit there and criticize your posts or your content, your CV. But if you wouldn't go to the first place to get their thoughts and feedback, then does it really matter? And then one that I created, which I think I probably stole from somebody else, is don't have champagne career ambitions and a lemonade work ethic, work ethic. <laughs> yeah. yeah i love that too that's very very true you mean there's no um quick uh, two-week program to millions no is that what you're telling me that's really disappointing i know you've probably seen them on youtube and all this like you know oh, like you're yeah. overnight but no unfortunately i think um it feels better when you earn it and you work hard for it and don't just kind of go the easy route do you there's no shortcuts to success yeah, well, the journey's the fun bit. You've, you've only got to talk to people who've achieved their goals and they're amongst the most miserable you ever find. They're trying to find out what <laughs> they can do next because you're absolutely right. It's the striving that makes and the, the work that makes it uh, enjoyable. Hmm. Absolutely love that. Where can people find you, mate? What's the best way to get in contact with you? Website addresses, LinkedIn addresses, etc. If people want Yeah, to- sure. Don't turn out to my house. I've got a big dog that's aggressive as hell. So um, I've got, well, no, it looks aggressive. I've got a German Shepherd who looks the, the, the real deal, but it's really a sort of a, a Pomeranian in disguise. So best place to go to his website. So it's um, cvupgrade.com is where you can find me. Anyone listening to this, this, this podcast too, it's the web designer. Drop me a DM because it's an awful website. I've literally just used GoDaddy and it needs a bit of love and care to it. Just having the time, of course. I've called people on LinkedIn and have me on there. Drop me a message. I'll come back to you, obviously, when I, when I can do. But um, I'm very approachable. If I don't find your DM, send me another one. I will get back to you, I promise you. Love it. So don't be put off by the UX or the dog. Reach out to Dom and uh, follow up with him. And just again, big thanks for coming on today, mate. I've been trying to get a slot in together. I'm glad that we managed to do so. It was great to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate you having me. Really enjoy myself. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. You've been listening to the Career Jump podcast with Andrew McCaskill. For more resources and information, just head over to the Career Jump website at www.execcareerjump.com to supercharge your job search and start making moves. Let's get to work. Get to work.